As new plant growth emerges in the spring, I'm excited to grab my basket and harvest edible weeds. When it comes to edible weeds, there's a whole feast of spring greens waiting just outside your door. I'm going to show you how to safely identify and harvest edible weeds and make delicious spring greens recipes. This will be helpful for you if you are harvesting from your own garden or yard or from more feral places like forests, meadows, and parks. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. Harvesting edible weeds can be fun and empowering. Knowing how to look at a landscape, identify the edible weeds as food, and then harvest them safely are skills everyone should have. When I harvested edible weeds for the first time, one thing that really stuck out in my mind was free food. I was in my young 20s, I didn't have a lot of money, and I was absolutely amazed at all the free edible weeds growing around me. Over time, however, I realized that edible weeds aren't actually free. They take time, they take energy, and as I spent more and more time with edible weeds, I also learned that the coolest part wasn't the free aspect. Instead, being outside, interacting with the plants, and giving back to the plants were the ultimate gift. So instead of simply plopping free food on the table, I was actively participating in this beautiful world around me and bringing deeper connections and meaning to my spring greens meals. This mindset switch from free edible weeds to a deeper connection with the food I eat has ultimately given me a richer life. I'll bet many of you have had the same experience. While you're watching, let me know in the comments below about your experience with edible weeds and spring greens recipes. It's always interesting and insightful to hear the experiences of plant lovers out there. And you never know, your suggestion may also help others. Okay, let's dive in. Harvesting edible weeds isn't hard, but you really have to know what you're doing in order to stay safe and to avoid causing damage both to yourself and your friends and the living world where you're harvesting. There's also important tips to make the whole process easy and fun. One of the most important safety aspects of harvesting edible weeds is to evaluate if you have enough time. Especially when you're harvesting a plant for the first time, you don't wanna be rushed. You need time to identify the plant. You need time to assess the area where you're harvesting. You need time to actually harvest and just as importantly, time to clean and prepare your spring greens recipes. Obviously, you're already investing time by watching this video or listening to the podcast. So well done on that part. Knowing how to properly identify the plant you're harvesting can mean the difference between life and death. You not only want to know how to identify the particular weed you want, but also to know their common lookalikes. You never want to be mostly sure about identification. You want to be 100% sure. I'm going to show you key identifying features for all of the edible weeds I'm sharing about today. Another really important and often overlooked part of harvesting edible weeds is respect. I doubt you would like it if someone walked into your space, made a mess, and started filling their bags with all your stuff. Sometimes edible weeds don't get as much respect or admiration as native wild plants, but I think that's flat out wrong. Part of respect is making sure you have permission to gather from that location. 
also when we go to gather edible weeds, we're entering a space that many beings call home. Whether it's the plants themselves, the insects and bugs that feast and find shelter there, the vast mycorrhizal networks beneath our feet, the birds that also forage and nest there, the mammals that frequent there, including other humans, and so on. From the moment you intend to gather edible weeds to sitting down to your spring greens meal, I promise you'll get the most out of the whole experience if you respect all the beings that we share these spaces with. Another aspect of safety is knowing how to assess if the area is safe to harvest from. Many edible weeds are great at phytoremediation or cleaning up the soils. That means they can pull toxins from the soils and then store them in their aerial parts. The only way to be absolutely certain if the soils are safe is to do a soil test. However, this can be a bit of a hurdle, especially if you harvest in multiple areas. You can also know a lot about the soils by knowing the history of those lands. Cautions to look out for include areas near train tracks, golf courses, roadsides, mines, or any other area where pollutants may have been spilled. I would also avoid places highly frequented by dogs. A basic question to ask when harvesting in an area is, do all of the plants in this area look healthy and vibrant? The better you know the lands you're harvesting from, the more you can ensure it's safe to harvest there. The last consideration I wanna highlight is the importance of ensuring that the areas where you harvest continue to thrive. This is important not only for future harvest, but also simply for respect and decency. I doubt that many people's intentions are to wipe out entire plant populations or just decimate an area, but sadly this happens, either out of naive ignorance or they're simply jerks who think that everything is theirs for the taking. Ways that you can make sure the area you harvest continues to thrive is by knowing what's an appropriate amount to harvest how to harvest so the plants continue to grow, and by stewarding or caregiving the area by filling in harvesting holes, picking up trash, etc. Okay, we've just covered a lot of things to consider about the harvest, and now I'm gonna stop there, but there's a lot more to know. If you're feeling the itch to really dive deep into harvesting edible weeds, then you'll love my book, Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Herbal Medicine. This book shows you everything you need to know to feel confident about harvesting edible weeds that grow around you. The beginning chapters show you the exact skills needed to harvest safely, and then each plant chapter gives specific information about the plant's benefits and gifts, like how to grow and harvest the plant sustainably, and many recipes for food and medicine. There are also beautiful botanical illustrations to help you correctly identify the plant. You can find Wild Remedies wherever books are sold. And then once you buy the book, don't miss out on your exclusive bonuses. Click the link in the show notes and video description for more information. Okay, let's look at our common edible weeds. Dandelion, Taraxacum officinale. Dandelions tell us that spring is here. Often among the first weeds to emerge, especially in northern climates, dandelions bring important early nectar to honeybees and lift the hearts of all who anticipate longer days and warmer temperatures. These golden orbs fill lawns and meadows and even appear between the cracks in concrete. Dandelion is both tenacious and generous and is one of our most needed plant foods and medicines. I love how generous dandelions are. Every part of this plant offers us food and medicine. It's totally incomprehensible to me that people pour billions of pounds of herbicides on these beautiful and generous plants every year. Those chemicals, of course, then pollute our lawns, our soils, and our waters. It's total madness. Dandelion is the edible weed that I wish everyone would fall in love with. Then, instead of poisoning the earth with chemicals, people could be harvesting the plant for spring greens. Dandelions are common and they're well known, but there are some very similar looking plants with yellow flowers that can be easily mistaken for dandelion. So it's important to know how to identify dandelion well. Let's start with the leaves. Dandelion leaves grow from a central point and can be anywhere from two to 14 inches long. 
they often have a toothed appearance. The leaves are smooth, not hairy. So if you're looking at a similarly shaped leaf, but it has a prickly spine or it's hairy, then you know it's not dandelion. The flowers are vibrantly yellow. Each flower grows from a single stem, which is a hollow stalk. That's an important distinction because some lookalikes have multiple flowers growing from one stem. What looks like a single flower is actually hundreds of individual flowers. We refer to this as a composite flower. At the bottom of each flower, there are pointy green bracts. These bracts often have a bitter flavor, and so they're typically removed when preparing the flowers for food. When you're learning how to recognize dandelion, it's helpful to be familiar with common lookalikes, which include cat's ear, hawkweed, sow thistle, chicory, and young wild lettuce. Many beings rely on dandelion for food, ranging from small insects to mammals, including rabbits, groundhogs, pocket gophers, deer, elk, and even bears. The flowers provide nectar and pollen to insects such as honeybees, native bees, bee flies, and hoverflies. After the blooms have gone to seed, birds are known to feast on those seeds. Every part of the dandelion plant can be harvested, but in this show, I'll focus on the leaves and flowers. When dandelion leaves are young and tender, they have a slightly bitter taste that many people find to be actually yummy. This bitter taste stimulates many digestive functions and secretions, including increased saliva, which helps to break down starches and carbohydrates, increased stomach enzymes that further break down starches and also proteins, and increased bile, which aids with fat digestion. It also helps to stimulate natural peristalsis to keep the bowels moving. For this reason, the leaves are considered a spring greens tonic, something that's taken to enliven digestion after a winter of heavy foods and meats and stored vegetables. Dandelion flowers are both food and medicine. As a food, they have a sweet bland taste and they're high in nutrients like lutein and beta carotene, which are both known for their ability to support eye health. In addition to vitamins and minerals, dandelion flowers are high in flavonoids. Leaves and flowers can be gathered by hand or with scissors throughout the growing season. The leaves are best when young as they become more bitter and tough as they age, but there's really no set rule as to when they're tasty and when they're not. So what I suggest is that you look for visibly young leaves, then just give them a little nibble and let your taste buds decide. The leaves can be eaten raw or cooked. I love them in salads or slightly wilted in warm wraps. Dandelion flowers tend to bloom big in the spring and then sporadically after. Flowers and buds can be used whenever they're available. Something to note is that the flowers will readily go to seed after you harvest them. So it's best to gather them and then use them immediately. When harvesting flowers, keep in mind that they provide early spring food for bees and other insects, so leave some behind for others. Also, harvest safely. Every year, billions of dollars are spent in herbicides attempting to eradicate the dandelion. Harvest dandelions in an area that hasn't been poisoned for at least three years and is free of heavy metals. If you'd like to know more about the medicinal and edible gifts of dandelion flowers and leaves, then I've got two resources for you. First is a video and podcast by me that's all about dandelion. The second is a free chapter about dandelion from my book, Wild Remedies. This excerpt also includes recipes like fermented dandelion buds and radishes, soca with dandelion greens, and my personal favorite, dandelion and maple syrup cake. You can find links to both of those resources in the show notes. Our next edible weed is stinging nettles, Urtica dioica. Stinging nettles demand your attention, and not just because they sting, but also because they offer so many powerful health benefits. Stinging nettles are highly nourishing. If you're feeling run down, depleted, or otherwise dragging yourself throughout the day, then turn to nettle leaves as they can support naturally healthy energy levels. It might do this through a variety of actions, but at least part of that action comes from the nutrient dense qualities. 
Nettle leaves are high in nutrients, including calcium, fiber, protein, potassium, flavonoids, like rutin, ascorbic acid, glucosamine, beta carotene, vitamin K, and so many more. Few plants boast the nutrient content of nettle, and few plants have benefits as dramatic when enjoyed frequently. Eating nettle or drinking the strong tea regularly often results in stronger bones, stronger teeth, and more vibrant hair. Nettle infusions or tea are also a reliable way to boost iron levels. I've spoken to many women who have chosen to use nettle instead of iron supplements in the early stages of pregnancy to increase their iron levels. And restoring iron levels can also help relieve fatigue. Some people experience muscle cramping due to nutrient deficiencies. Regular ingestion of nettles can restore mineral reserves and relieve menstrual cramps or leg cramps. A study done in April of 2021 showed that adding nettles to bread significantly increased the nutrient content, including fiber, calcium, copper, and iron. The nettle enhanced bread also had superior antioxidant qualities. No surprise, because nettle is amazing. Nettles are also easy to find and harvest in many places. And they're easy to identify once you know them. But there are some common lookalikes, so it's important to pay attention to the details. Nettle is an herbaceous perennial that can grow to about three to six feet in height, which is about one to two meters. It's both native and introduced plant in North America and likes to grow in disturbed soils that are protein rich. It prefers damp soils. It grows on long stalks that have a square stem with jagged, simple leaves that grow opposite. Leaves growing opposite are a key identifying feature of nettles. Small needle-like projections cover the stalk and leaves of most species. However, stingless nettles do exist, even within the Urtica dioca species. Small flowers grow in the leaf axils in the summer, which turn into green fruits by the late summer. Both male and female flowers grow on a single plant in the Urtica dioca species. It's not recommended to eat nettle leaves after the plant has gone to flower or seed. There's some concerns that the plant may irritate the kidneys at this stage or even harm digestion of it. However, once they've gone to seed, those leaves are also lacking vibrancy. So overall, it's definitely best to harvest them when young. Because nettles can concentrate heavy metals and inorganic nitrates, pay extra attention to your harvesting areas. Lookalike plants include wood nettle, which is edible, false nettle, and clear weed. To avoid getting stung when harvesting nettles, wear gloves and even long sleeve shirts. Speaking of getting stung, some of you might be wondering, why would you want to eat something that stings you? Well, stinging nettle can be eaten freely as food, but it needs to be properly prepared. More about that in just a bit. Here's a major tip for harvesting nettles. Harvest the top portion of the plant, cutting the stem just above the leaf axle. When you harvest like this, the plant is stimulated to grow back, often even more densely. It's possible to tend a nettle patch and keep the harvesting the leaves well into the summer. It's best to harvest the leaves, put them loosely in a basket. You don't want to bruise the leaves or they will discolor. Okay, here's how you get rid of the sting. Once they're harvested, blanch the leaves in boiling water for about two minutes. This removes the sting, so easy peasy. After that, you can use them as you would any cooked green. Some of my favorite ways to eat nettle include nettle soup, lasagna, stir-fried greens, spanakopita, green smoothies, pesto. That's just to name a few examples. Also, here's another tip. Save the residual blanched water to drink as a tea or as a base for soups, or feed the cool water to your house plants because they love it too. I love stinging nettles, which is why this plant is featured in both of my books, Alchemy of Herbs and Wild Remedies. Both books have a different collection of my favorite nettle recipes, including stinging nettle lasagna, nettle leaf dukkha, stinging nettle and asparagus soup, and nettle frittata. 
I also have a video and podcast about stinging nettle benefits and side effects and a video and podcast about stinging nettle tea. This is a powerful edible weed that deserves a place in your spring greens recipes. Our next edible weed is the beautiful violet, viola species. One of my favorite springtime activities is wild crafting edible violets with the sun on my skin, the birds singing around me, and that alluring scent of viola odorata just permeating the air. It's a joyful experience that only spring can offer. Violet flowers and leaves offer us both medicine and food. I'm focusing mainly on food for this show, but I do have a previous video and podcast on violets that shares more of their medicinal benefits. The flowers and leaves contain high amounts of vitamin C, and the leaves are also high in beta carotenes, which are a precursor to vitamin A. Violet is high in antioxidant, anthocyanins, and rutin, which are both known to support heart health by strengthening and increasing flexibility in blood vessels, reducing cholesterol, and preventing heart disease. Energetically, violets are cooling and moistening. They can bring relief to hot, dry tissues and modulate inflammation. I love working with the flowers to make beautiful syrups and garnishes, which can be used in foods and beverages alike. The leaves can be eaten raw or cooked when young. However, it's a good idea to eat just a little bit at first. See how your tummy reacts. Both the flowers and leaves make a wonderful tea. Violets are found throughout the world, though they mostly occur in temperate climates. They love to grow in damp, shady places. Weedy varieties will delightfully grow all across the lawn. Violets typically flower generously in the springtime, making that the easiest time to find them. Where I live, violets start to bloom around the same time as dandelions, but you can find their leaves persisting throughout the growing season. The leaves by themselves can easily be mistaken for other plants. Following the plant for a year to see how it looks throughout the seasons is always a good idea. If you aren't sure where violet might be growing near you, ask around. You may be surprised to find a neighbor or friend who has an abundant amount in their lawn and they don't mind you coming to harvest. You can also consider growing violets. They are a bit hard to grow from seed, so it's best to transplant them. For the past several years, I've been planting violet starts all over my yard in the hopes of one day having lots and lots of flowers one day. There are lots of kinds of violets out there, up to 600 different species. There are also many modern cultivars used in gardens, often called pansies or Johnny Jump Ups. While many species are indeed purple, as the name violet implies, the flowers of the viola genus range from white to yellow to blue and purple, and they can also be multicolored. Many violets are used similarly, but viola odorata is one of the only ones with that evocative scent. Violets have irregular flowers with five separate petals arranged in bilateral or side-to-side -side symmetry. Sometimes the flowers are described as having an X and then the fifth petal is at the bottom like a tongue sticking out. Viola odorata flowers are a deep purple color. They have five sepals which can persist after the flower has bloomed. Each flower is on a leafless stalk. In some violet species, the showy flowers of the spring are actually sterile and they don't help the plant to reproduce. Later in the season, Cleistogamous flowers, which are closed, self-pollinated flowers, form seeds beneath the leaves. Both types of flowers result in a three-pronged seed head, which can open with incredible force, boom, ejecting the seeds meters away from the original plant. The simple leaves are either alternate or basal and are often heart-shaped with rounded tooths along the edges, which are called crenate margins. While violet flowers are easy to recognize, violet leaves have some look-alikes, some of them quite toxic, including monkshood and lesser celandine. Always be certain you can identify the plant before harvesting. I recommend getting a local field guide to help you identify specific violets that are growing near you. I'm also often asked if African violets that are commonly grown as houseplants can be used the same way as violets. The answer is no, this is an entirely different plant. Violets are easy to harvest using only your fingers. The flowers and leaves can just be pinched off 
just take care not to disturb the roots. You can harvest violet leaves throughout the growing season, but the spring leaves will be the most tender and best for eating. Leaves later in the season are best for drying for tea. Native violets are much more sensitive to being over foraged. They can also be tricky to determine how strong their populations are. Violets tend to grow in isolated patches, so you might find one big patch of native violets, but it may be the only patch for many miles. So unless you're deeply connected to the land you're harvesting from and know for certain that your harvest won't negatively impact native violets, then I would stick with the weedy varieties. To learn more about sustainable and regenerative harvesting, check out my second book, Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Your Own Herbal Medicine. In there, we also have an entire chapter about violets and recipes, including things like violet vinegar, violet oxymel, two violet cocktails, and a spring flowers massage oil with both violets and dandelion flowers. Well, there you have it, three edible weeds for you to harvest. These three plants are some of my very favorite for spring greens recipes. As an herbal teacher, I'm happiest when you're successful, whether that's foraging edible weeds, making herbal medicines, or strengthening your connection to nature. That's why I have lots of additional resources for you. As a reminder, there's more edible weeds videos on dandelion, violet, and nettle, and a chapter handout with lots of dandelion recipes. Visit the link in the video description to grab your bonuses. Also, pick up a copy of my book, Wild Remedies, to get more tips and recipes for edible weeds. If you enjoyed this video on edible weeds and spring greens, and you value trusted herbal information, then I hope you'll stick around. The best way to get started is to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you can be the first to get my best herbal insights and recipes.